Good evening. Luke chapter 12 tonight, as we roll along with these 49 commands of Christ, we're knocking them out. We're on uh, number 31 this evening. And uh, oh, let's see. As I was preparing for this command tonight, beware of covetousness. I know we all struggle with sin, and there's no doubt about that, but I'll say at this church, one of the strengths of this church is generosity. I can say that without a doubt. I've seen it demonstrated in the lives of many people here, including our own. We've been the recipients of this church's generosity over and over again. I, uh, I challenged myself to create a list, uh, finally. I, I don't normally like to compile acts of kindness, but I decided there was so much here at this church I'm like, I've got to break it down. So I got three categories, all right? I got words of wisdom, words of encouragement, and then, uh, no, I'm sorry, hospitality, words of encouragement, and generosity. So things given or dinners shared, you know, dinners shared would be under hospitality, watching kids, hospitality, a fishing pond to go fishing at, invitations for meals, all that's under hospitality, housing us when we moved out here. Generosity would be the random checks and gift cards or, or food items or, I mean, you name it. And I am up to eight and a half pages, single space, Microsoft Word, 12 font in Times New Roman, okay? So, that's a lot, and that's just this church. And I'm thinking, man, I mean, the thank you cards are going to be about a $500 investment here, you know. So I'm like, I better keep saying thank you while I got a microphone, you know. But, uh, but I mean, this church, I just before we get into this, I just want to recognize that. I, I know the irony is when you're generous, uh, Satan's also going to tempt you to be covetous, and usually that's how you respond is by saying, no, I'm not going to be greedy. I'm going to give. So I understand that. Because you're generous, it is also going to be a struggle. It's also going to be a struggle uh, to be greedy because you're like, you know what? Sometimes you give, and does everybody appreciate what you give all the time? Of course not. Sometimes you get it thrown back in your face, and you're thinking, okay, well, that, you know, okay, fine. I'm not going to do that anymore. Well, we, we sometimes we've got to have an attitude adjustment here. I am actually going to grab the other pulpit real quick, and, and Tom, I'll set it right here. But um, with this Bible and with some of the pages I use, it works better to have a broader. So I'll, I'll keep that lectern down there. Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21 is where we're going to be tonight. And we're going to go ahead and get ready to read that. The words will be up on the screen. We're just going to cover one command tonight. Uh, at times we've covered as many as eight in one evening, but we're not doing that tonight. We're going to focus on this one. Luke chapter 12, if you'd please stand with me for the reading of the word tonight, if you're physically able, and we'll have the words up on the screen. If you'd just uh, follow along as we read. Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 13. Someone from the crowd said to him, said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Friend, Jesus said to him, who appointed me as a judge or arbiter over you? He then told them, Watch out, be on guard against all greed, because one's life is not in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable, verse 16. A rich man's land was very productive, and he thought to himself, Well, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and build up bigger ones and store all my grains and goods there. And then I'll say to myself, You have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, You fool. This very night your life is demanded of you, and the things you've prepared, well, whose will they be? That's how it is with the one who stores up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. Please remain standing as we pray. Lord, these are your words. We're your people. We've gathered today to hear from you. We practice this every day. Lord, I'm praying this is true for everyone here tonight. This is a part of our daily practice, seeking you, not perfectly, but fervently, faithfully. Lord, tonight we hear your command about covetousness, about greed. And we need this now more than ever in a world that begs for us to buy their products and to grab their credit and to get sucked into this machine that has so many people in bondage. Heavenly Father, I pray we work as those who are empowered by you through knowing what's going on to reach out and minister to others. 
We pray for you to continue to show us what you have for us from your word tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So is Jesus telling us in this teaching to neglect our resources? I mean, is that what you get out of this? Is he saying neglect your resources? You know what? It's just stuff. It's all going to burn. Is this world going to burn? I know there may be some differences in eschatology there and say, well, maybe. I, I'm just telling you, I believe from Scripture it's clear this earth will be destroyed with a fervent heat. Okay, that's the approach I'm taking here. So uh, whether you believe that or not, it is clear that our life is but a vapor and all of this stuff is not going with us to heaven. We can at least agree on that point. So is, is Jesus saying neglect our resources and, and don't worry about the stuff, it's just stuff? Is that what he's saying here? Mark chapter 10, turn there with me if you will. Let's see what else he has to say about it. You know, what's the best commentary for Scripture? Scripture. Tom got it right away. That was good. I like that. I was getting nervous. That was a little bit of a pause. I believe the best commentary for Scripture is Scripture itself. I use other resources. I use other uh, expository uh, you know, uh, uh, commentaries and expositional commentary, uh, expositional and exegetical commentaries. There we go. I couldn't, couldn't find the word there for a second. Uh, but I believe the best, the primary commentary for Scripture is going to be itself. Mark chapter 10, verses 21 through 22. Then looking at him, we'll get to that in just a second, Jesus loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But he was stunned at this demand, and he went away grieving because he had many possessions. Who is Jesus talking to here? That's right, the rich young ruler. What was his response? He, he went away grieving. I mean, it, it, you think if you met Jesus face to face and he gave you any requirement, any requirement, not to mention selling all your possessions, don't you think it'd be kind of a no-brainer? Like, this is the Jesus? He'll take care of me. And yet he was grieved and he walked away. Was Jesus telling this man to set a precedent by letting go of all the stuff? Or what was being addressed here? What was wrong with the rich young ruler? What, what do you think was being addressed? What was the core issue here? Priorities. Priorities. At times, Jesus would even instruct his disciples to go and get some things for their journey. He'd say, go get this stuff. You're going to need some of this stuff for your journey. And at other times, he'd say, put it away. So you don't need that. But the constant theme is that the attitude of our heart is no matter what possessions we have, we receive them with an open hand so we can let them go with an open hand. We're to be channels, not cisterns. You're familiar with the concept of a cistern. How many have had to clean out a nasty cistern before? Oh, stagnant, nasty. Earl looked like he had a story when he raised his hand. <laughs> Boy, he looked down. I was like, oh, man, we got a story there. It's nastiness. And that's what happens when we take these resources with an attitude of greed, even if we earn them fairly and we're, we're, we're not wasting money necessarily. But when we take stuff and we treat it like we've got a cistern and it's just ours never to be shared and we seal it up. That's the attitude of a cistern, not a channel. And the Lord expects that when he blesses us, we receive it like a conduit, like a channel that can pass it along. If we have the stuff, if we've got a nice toy for 10, 20, 30 years, there's nothing wrong with that as long as it is open. Ecclesiastes makes it clear there's nothing wrong with working hard and playing hard. Enjoying your money, buying some toys, as long as you're responsible in these other areas. But those toys must be held with an open hand. Now, we'll, we'll get to the rest of that conversation with riches here in a minute. But this is what Jesus is addressing, is an issue of the heart in both of these passages in Mark chapter 10 and what we're reading tonight out of Luke chapter 12. So I don't believe neglect is an option here. I don't believe that's what Jesus is teaching. I don't believe he's teaching us to neglect our stuff, just take off and leave it because it doesn't matter anyway. What's one of the concepts he hammers when it comes to resources and money? We are to be good 
stewards. So there is a responsibility there. I don't see the option or the freedom to neglect. Even in Acts chapter 4, verse 32, that's where we got this phrase. We've talked about it a couple times, having all things in common. And it was this picture that they just pretty much put all their stuff in a, some kind of organized warehouse or heap or whatever and say, hey, if you, need, if you need wrenches, I've got wrenches in my barn. You know, if you need some soup tonight, I've got soup in my pantry. You know, whatever. But again, I believe that was a situational answer. It was a manifestation to the Holy Spirit. Had just indwelt these people, and so their first reflection of the Holy Spirit was there was very severe needs in their congregation. And so immediately the Spirit led them to a point of unity, and that first step of unity was, hey, my stuff is your stuff. Brother, sister, if you need it, you come get it. I see that general attitude in this church, and yet we don't have a commune warehouse. Okay, because there's other subjects such as hard work, Work ethic, expectation. You don't, what does the scripture say? You don't work, you don't. Ooh. Mm. You want to go announce that on public television tonight? What was that, CNN? You think they'd go for that, Tom? Is, no? So, okay. Mm. <laughs> now, there's other issues when it comes to poverty and, and, and things like that. I understand that. But right now, what we're focusing on here is this teaching of greed. And so I'm just striking the boundary over here that I don't believe neglect is an option when it comes to resources. God gives us resources for a reason. So the attitude we need to have is while they're in our possession, that's the key word. If you've got a million dollars in the savings account or you don't have a savings account, you know, it is while it's in there. If you have that attitude of while it's here, then you understand it's temporary. And that, that temporary may stay with you the rest of your life. And God just chooses, hey, you're the perfect steward for this, whatever it is, house, land, cars, whatever it is, while it's yours. And as long as we have that attitude, then when something happens and the Lord pricks our heart with a need, we're made aware of a need we can meet, and we're moved to do that, it is much easier, not easy, but it's much easier to go ahead and let that go and say, Lord, thank you for the time I had this. That's what he's addressing here. He's addressing the heart of the issue. Now you say, Mike, I, I already figured some of this out. That's fine, but I don't take this for granted on any of Jesus' commands because the, the enemy is looking for every opportunity to twist these commands. And I'm sure some people have come to you with these conversations. You know, so if I'm going to be a Christian. Do I have to take a vow of poverty? Well, no. He calls us just to live with an attitude of openness. Now, does that sometimes mean that there are Christians who live in poverty? What did the Apostle Paul have to say about that? What do you say? He said, I, I've learned to be content. I've learned to do without. And I, like I said, I learned to do with abundance. And I just got to wonder what that meant. Did that mean he had a friend on the Mediterranean that hooked him up with a summer home? I don't know what that meant, you know. Uh, but he doesn't go into detail. He basically said, whenever he said much, he was talking about wealth. You know, he's saying, basically, I've learned to, at times I've lived surrounded by comforts and wealth. And at times I've been completely without. I mean, in a ship as a prisoner. There's no wealth there. I don't care how good of a prisoner you are. There's no comforts there. And yet, he's, he says, I've learned to be content. And we'll get to that here in a minute. So the, the next question I have, back in Luke chapter 12, our passage tonight, verses 13 through 21. You know, he says, who appointed me judge or arbiter over you? Now, we talked about the judge standing at the door this morning, and that's not what he's getting at. He's not saying, I'm not the judge. He's just saying, uh, similar to when the rich young ruler, what did he call him? He said, hey, good teacher. And what was Jesus' response? Why do you call me good? In other words, this person hadn't recognized Christ as the true Messiah. He was just calling him a teacher. He just knew him as a teacher. In this case, it's very similar. Someone's coming to hit Jesus, not as the Son of God judge, but as just another judge on the face of the earth who could solve their problems. And so whenever his response here is he's saying, who appointed me judge? Did he say, I am not your judge? What was his response? He said, who appointed me judge? Very similar to saying, why do you say that I'm good? Now, the response was not a confession. He said, watch out and be on guard against all the greed, all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of possessions. And then he goes on to give this parable. And he seems to almost be condemning this guy who builds bigger barns and puts a lot of investment into the future. It almost seems to be a condemnation of that. So is Jesus teaching us to have apathy about the future? To show apathy towards what's coming next? Do you think that's, that's the point of the passage here? 
in addition to neglecting resources, is he, is he saying to be apathetic about our future? You think that's what he's advocating for? I mean, Christ is going to return any day, right? We don't know when he's going to return. So why, why does it matter what's going to happen tomorrow? If he could return tonight, why am I worried about tomorrow? Is that what he's teaching here when he seems to get after this guy in the parable for stocking up for the future? You what? That's right, one day at a time. Yeah, that's right. Because in the prayer that Jesus gave to the disciples, he asked us, he directed us that we were to be asking him for our, our weekly bread, daily bread, daily provision, daily trusting him. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 17 through 19. Because I don't think you can talk about the future of a Christian without talking about the new life of a Christian. It's not that we have an optimistic future. It's that we have a secure future. It's not about having a happy future. Now, eternity with God is going to be bliss. All right? Make no mistake. But as far as our future here on this time on earth, we're not promised happiness. We are promised a peace that passes understanding as we walk with God. We are uh, promised a joy that's going to survive every kind of challenge. But joy doesn't always look like happiness or even feel like happiness. It is a faith that doesn't allow us to sink under discouragement sometimes. Sometimes it's more of a healthy pulse than it is a laugh. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 19. Therefore I say this and testify in the Lord. You should no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their thoughts. They are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their hearts. Look at that phrase, the hardness of their hearts, right there at the end of verse 18. We're talking about new life versus this hardness of the heart. When we talk about apathy for the future, I'm getting a red flag right here about callousness and about the hardness of hearts. In other words, not caring. Verse 19, they became callous and gave themselves over to promiscuity for the practice of every kind of impurity with a desire for more and more. Now here the callousness, the indifference is about the things of God. So when they're indifferent about the things of God, they do whatever the blazes comes across their mind. They give in to selfish impulses. Tom had mentioned the fruits of the Spirit earlier. And one of the fruits of the Spirit that you're not going to hear discussed very often in the United States of America is the fruit of self-control. Now, when we're having this conversation tonight, we're hearing what Jesus has to teach about finances. And we're talking about new life and looking at the future with a new life mentality. I call it an eternal perspective. I didn't come up with the word. That's just the phrase I use. Eternal perspective. It's the idea of being able to look through life right now, not ignore it, but look through it, asking the question, what's this going to matter when I stand before the throne? Asking the question, what's this going to look like when my name is read in the Lamb's book of life? I already know it's written. I already know it's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That was taken care of when I was six years old when I put my faith in Jesus Christ. But the eternal perspective is able to look through the current circumstances and what's coming down the road and is able to say, when my life is but a vapor, how much is this going to matter? Now, there are things that we do here on earth that will matter for eternity. And we need to highlight those. We need to emphasize those. And in this case, we're almost there. When we're talking about covetousness, what would be the opposite? Give me some ideas here. What, when you think of the, the antithetical example of covetousness, what words come to mind? I'm going to start humming the Jeopardy song here in a minute. Come on, just toss some words out there. There's a, there's a couple good options, I think. Several good options. Generosity. That was one of them. There's a couple more. The opposite of coveting. The opposite of greed. Generosity. What are some other words that come to mind? Charity. Charity right? Giving. Giving to help others. Giving out of love. There's another one I'm thinking of here. We've touched on it already, but I think we need to zero in on it here in just a second.
Matthew chapter 6, oh, I'm going to ask again. Let's go ahead and look at some passages real quick. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. We're looking for the opposite of covetousness right now. And I think generosity, charity, though that's a good, excellent direction. And we're going to talk about generosity a little bit more here in just a few minutes. But Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 20, I believe it makes it clear when it comes to finances or our future, we're not allowed to be apathetic about either of those things because both our time and our financial resources are gifts to us. You can't stomp out a gift. You can't neglect a gift. Now, we're talking. This, I'm not even talking about spiritual gifts right now. I'm just talking about the gift of resources and the gift of time. These are gifts, so I can't be apathetic towards them. I can't neglect them. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 20 gives some clear directive here. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 19. Don't collect for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but collect for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. Now, it would be simple for me to stand here and say that passage isn't talking about money at all, but I think that would be a lie. I believe it is, it is extended and can be applied beyond finances, but it includes finances when it talks about investing our treasures into heaven. It is not exclusive to finances, but I believe it includes finances, that whatever we are given, opportunities of time, a chance to obey the Lord in a directive, time we spend raising godly children, grandchildren, working with children here in the church, I believe those are investments into the kingdom of heaven when their hearts are moldable and fresh, and for all ages for that matter, but I, I, I think of all these areas. And when I look here in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, and I think of finances, I believe the Lord cares about what we do with our money. What do you think he talked more about, heaven, hell, or money? Money. I can't be apathetic about finances because I, I don't believe the Lord was. He sees these things as a gift, and he expects us to be good stewards of them, to take care of it and enjoy it while we have it, but always be willing to let go and give as he directs us instead of tuning them out because we're like, oh, yeah, I'm willing to give, but I can't hear anything you're saying. So, huh, you know, and when he brings needs across our path, we're like, well, I guess I'll just keep enjoying it. And we're down a couple slides on this. Uh, we're, we're actually about to wrap up the next series here. Uh, now on to Proverbs chapter 30, verse 8. This was one verse that the Lord had brought to mind before we first started off into full-time ministry. We made that move from Wichita, Kansas to Watauga, Tennessee. Olivia and I did. We got a 5 by 8 U-Haul trailer and hooked it up to a 1994 Chevy Suburban. And uh, we didn't even know where we were going to live at the Bible camp. And we had not gathered that much support at that point in time. We, we were completely dependent on raising missionary support. And uh, we knew we had a place to stay. And we had food there at the Bible camp. And we had work to do. They needed us. And so we took off. And uh, this was one verse. And the Lord did provide. He was faithful. And we were able to find uh, churches to partner with us. And it, it was a wonderful time of seeing the Lord open up doors. But here, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 8 uh, keep falsehood and deceitful words far from me. Give me neither poverty nor wealth. Feed me with the food I need. Now, in the King James that we had, you know, is give me neither poverty nor riches, but feed me with food convenient for me. In other words, give me what I need. Don't, Lord, don't let us, don't let us struggle. I saw, I saw that as something I could pray for. Now, when I say struggle... Uh, yeah, we were white knuckling it, and yeah, it was beans and rice, and yeah, there were some times where it was like, hmm, this isn't very much fun, but uh, we never needed to skip a meal. Whether we had it in our pantry or something was available that at the camp dining hall where they say, hey, you're more than welcome to go get a meal, we jumped on it. Now, it was camp food, so bear that in mind, but uh, the Lord provided and he blessed, and we saw him not only provide for our needs, but then at times would provide for things that we just wanted to do for fun. He did good stuff like that, and he has done good stuff like that ever since we've been married. And honestly, even while we were kids, there was examples of, of the Lord's provision. And I believe that's how he works. I don't believe the Lord is against wealth. 
I don't see that anywhere in Scripture. He warns and cautions against it, just like he would many other things in Scripture to say, this can be addicting, this can be controlling, this can capture your heart. So keep your eyes on me. Whatever wealth I give you, if I give you $5 million, hold it like this. Hold it like this. If you've only got $5 left and you've got three days till your next paycheck, hold it like this. Because A, I may use that $5 to take care of you for the next three days. Or B, I may be about uh, to provide you with what you need. Whether that's in the form of food, work to earn money for more food, or just a gift. Because our God's a generous God and He works with gifts. So we can't be closed off saying, I will not let anybody give me anything because I'm going to work for everything I've got. Because sometimes God says, yeah, I'm glad you're working for what you've got, but I also want to give you something. So we've got to be open enough to accept gifts. Have you ever given somebody something and then they tell you they don't want it and give it back to you? Have you ever had that happen to you? Libby and I have had that happen to us a couple times. It hurts. Because uh, the message we receive is not, hey, I don't want you to, to, you know, I don't want you to help us out. We're fine. The message is, the Lord didn't tell you to give that to me. That's what we hear. Because we give as we're moved. And sometimes it's not even because we've heard of a need. We're just moved, just, hey, this, and it's not always big stuff. Sometimes it's small stuff, but the small stuff makes a big difference because it's a gesture of gratitude. That hurts. So w that's why we got to live with an open hand because we also, just as much as we need to be willing to let go of our resources, we also need to be willing to let the Lord bless us. And that can be hard. I think especially from my background in Kansas, I've seen that very difficult. We like to work for what we have and say that we like to get to the end of life and said, say, uh, I've never asked anybody for anything. Or say, well, you know, I never had anything I didn't earn. Okay. Well, there's merit to that, but the Lord still loves to give. Now again, you don't work, you don't... Okay, we're talking about generosity here, not welfare. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 through 18. I don't believe we're, we have the ability to have apathy about the future. Okay, we, we cannot neglect our resources and we can't be apathetic about the future. And this can be a hard line to walk sometimes. Because you do look around and you think, man, what is the point? When is this world going to get any better? I got news for you. The world's not going to get any better. We can have impacts and effects on this world, and we can see God's redemption move. There were times in Israel, Israel's history where it got really dark. But there would be a remnant. The Lord would move, and then there would be a movement of, Lord through, of the Lord throughout the land, a revival. And then it would go back into a season of darkness, and I believe we've seen the same thing here in America. I don't know how long that cycle is going to keep going on, but I believe as things get dark, I think we're, we wait and we'll see the Lord continue to move in the hearts of the remnant, and we'll see another period of light and revival. But you know what? Eventually, the frequency between these revivals and the greatness of these revivals continue to diminish because when the Lord returns, there'll be no more need for these things. And the earth is groaning in anticipation of the return of the king. And so are the people. And the darkness is going to run and hide from the light and that confrontation and that judgment that's coming for those who don't know Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 through 18. Our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Again, eternal perspective. We're looking through what we have around us right now to the eternal promises and truth of Jesus Christ. That's how we live, with an eternal perspective. It doesn't deny the solutions or the problems around us. It accepts them in the light of Jesus Christ. And when we're talking about covetousness, and we're talking about greed, God is not saying to neglect our resources or be apathetic about the future. He's saying to use our time and our finances with His eternal insight. That's what He's calling us to. If we're not going to do it, nobody else is. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And then, and then we're going to talk a little bit about generosity before we close. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verses 5 and 6. 
We of all people should be alert, engaged, and vigilant about the Great Commission until the return of Christ. We should know this. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. For you're all sons of light and sons of the day. We don't belong to the night or the darkness. So then we must not sleep like the rest, but we must stay awake and be serious. Do you see room in there to be apathetic about the future of the United States of America? Do you see room there to be apathetic about the future of our children and grandchildren? I don't see any room there. I'm told we're to be engaged, we're to be participating in solutions here, Christ centered solutions, the kind of solutions he came to bring. We don't find other solutions and put his name on it. We find the solutions that he brought down and we apply those. I'd ask you to think about another word. There's one more word before we move on and finish our last point tonight. We got generosity. We talked about charity. There's another word there when it comes to the opposite of covetousness and it's another C word. That's it. Contentment. Generosity and contentment. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. I got to know, Ross, did you come up with that or did Charla tell you to say that? Oh, okay, okay. I heard the whispering back there and I was like, uh-oh. Somebody didn't cite their sources. <laughs> oh, wait, guys. Uh, Stop it. Thank you, Kent, so much. Somebody get that man a pumpkin spice latte. First <laughs> Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we could take nothing out. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. If we have food and clothing, where was housing on that? Now, I'm not making light of people who are having housing struggles, but I am saying this. God said he would make sure he would take care of our day-to-day -day needs, and I, I believe a shelter that shelter can be a part of that. But I'm saying this. We add so much to the list that we say, Lord, how come my air conditioner broke? Can air conditioning, can a lack of air conditioning lead to some health issues? Sure. But we've got to remember, sometimes he calls us to adapt and overcome. And what we come to the Lord with so many times, and I've been guilty of this too, especially when it comes to like transportation or vehicles, and I come to the Lord and I think, okay, um, this isn't working over here, and I need this to do whatever. And then if I give it another 15 seconds, I say, you know what? Actually, the Lord's provided in other ways. I'll make my need known, but then I trust that he may already have a solution. Half the times he's already got a solution for us. And maybe he'll even grant uh, what we're thinking of, but he wants us to see that he's always providing for our needs. Can we define needs, please? I think some of that responsibility rests on us to define needs. And we've got to redefine them. You know why? Because the world's telling us what our needs are. What was so revolutionary about Apple, the company Apple? What did Steve Jobs do to the market in a huge way that no one else had done before. What was he known for when it came to products and needs? He convinced people they needed the product. He said, I, I want to tell people what they need. Now, he wasn't the only one. He, he built off of a model that had been pre-existing, and he did very well at it. Um, Jeremy Benstein is an editor for a Jewish publication called My Jewish Learning, and he's done a lot of research into the, the history of our economy and our anticipation of, uh, <laughs> of products and stuff and when it comes to greed. And here's, one of the, here's a statement that I think hits the nail on the head for 2017. Because producers covet consumers' money, they need to get consumers to covet their goods. Social historians note a change in American advertising after World War I from conveying product information to a manufacturing desire. The public then and business people feared that was too fragile. So to rev up the economy, products were associated with images, glamour, and personal identity. Marketing moved from fulfilling needs to creating them. 
Thirty years later, the post-World War II boom gave us planned obsolescence, whose most recent incarnation is the need for continual upgrading of our electronic gadgets. Planned obsolescence. They design things knowing they'll need to be replaced. How about car parts? The days of the shade tree mechanic are getting more and more limited. I don't think it's because there's a loss of desire, although that's part of the problem. So you've got a lot of people that just don't want to put in the hard work. But if you try to work on some of these vehicles, there's so many computers. I mean, I, you know, I see Dave Ruddick shaking his head. He could tell you. I mean, he knows cars. But the difference he's seen from the kind of cars he likes to work with to these cars with the computers and chips and codes and wires that if you pull one thing out, the car's going to blow up. You know, it's going to be a, just a safety protocol. Boom, there goes your car. I can remember Dad was concerned when I was a kid because uh, he had a 1995 Bonneville, and he was concerned because uh, it felt like the transmission was going out. And, I mean, things, gears were slipping, and he was getting concerned, and he was a troubleshooter. I remember many nights working with him, uh, laying down there on the gravel driveway, handing him wrenches and sockets and stuff. We'd work on cars all the time together, and, but uh, he couldn't figure this one out. And I remember as a kid, that was the first time I'd really seen my dad get stumped on a vehicle. I'm thinking, what's going on? The world is ending. My dad doesn't know how to fix the car. Well, we took it in, and it turned out there was a chip that was a part of the transmission that wasn't sending codes out properly because we lived on dirt roads and it managed to, the dust and dirt uh, managed to work its way up in through one of the seals and it clogged up this chip and code reader and it was a $50 part, $400 for labor. <laughs> Planned obsolescence. We live in a world that says, here's what you need and then you're going to need us to fix it and update it for you the rest of your life. And you can find ways to be free from that, but I'm saying as a general rule, when it comes to covetousness and what Jesus was teaching about in the first century, we've seen a new issue enter into that, and that is our world of marketing and commercials. You know one solution we have for commercials as a family, and this is one of the reasons we don't have cable or satellite television, is we don't think it's evil in and of itself, although some of the new programming, that could be debatable. Uh, our concern is the commercials. We, just, we honestly just couldn't even enjoy something because there were so many commercials. And it's not even that all of the commercials were bad, although some of them are. It was just, there was just so many commercials. I don't want to be told what to buy. I already have enough trouble, as is. It's like going shopping hungry. You know you're not supposed to do that. And yet, every time I think, I'm going to get the groceries first, and I'm going to grab fast food on the way home. This is, if, I, if I ever try to help out, that's what I think. If I'm going to help Olivia out, I'm like, I'm going to get the groceries for her, and I'm going to get fast food on the way home. The problem is by the time I'm done shopping and I'm three times over the grocery budget, I don't have money to get fast food on the way home because you don't go shopping hungry. Okay, I haven't done that for several years, but, but that's what we think. We walk in there and to get your basic products like milk and eggs, where do you got to go in the store? You got to go to the back. Do they give you a straight aisle, hallway to walk down, or what do you got to walk around? Those sugar cookies right now. And everything, and now you guys can tell me, at the Walmart right now, every sugar cookie, bread, cake, pie right now is what flavor? It's those pumpkin spice bread that's blocking my way to get some milk. I like pumpkin. My favorite pie is pumpkin pie. I just, I just don't know why everything has to be pumpkin spice, okay? I know I've said it before, and I might say it again before it falls over, but I'm just saying... Don't get this mixed up. I enjoy pumpkin pie very much. I just don't know why we're obsessing over pumpkin spice. All right, that's all I'm going to say tonight. That's it. But that's, that's part of the marketing. That's part of the marketing and creating a need in ourselves. And what we're called to do as Christians is to live with this open hand mentality that says two things. We talked about a little bit earlier that we can be generous because we can be open and giving and we can also be content because we're not out trying to grab other things. We're not saying, I, I've got to have this latest electronic gadget because you're content with what you have. Yeah, you've got some glitches, but you know what? Every new phone they come out with, you know what the complaints they have are in the first month? All the glitches. And yet, somehow we think the glitches on our old phone are worse than the glitches that are going to be on the new phone. 
because there's some new app, there's some new tool, and some of these tools are great, and I love using this stuff, but I'm just saying, be aware. That can be a form of covetousness and greed, where we're always reaching out and grabbing. If we live with an open hand, and we've got enough money to enjoy a toy, a new gadget, that's great, enjoy it. But, but live with this open hand, not saying, well, you know, I'm just going to hold on to this until the next one comes out, and then I'm going to get the next one. That's usually not what we think. We invest this money, and we think, okay, I'm going to enjoy it. And then eventually something happens, something sneaks in there and says, hey, you need to go ahead and get this. And then it sits on our heart. It's not just something like, hey, I enjoy this. It's like, oh, I've got, I, I'm not talking about a need like, you know, hey, you got a need to get tires for your car or something to protect your family or, or something to improve the household. I'm not talking about that. I, I'm talking about we're not being content with what the Lord's given us. And I, I've got to admit, that's something I've struggled with since I was a kid. Because I think if it drives faster, it must be better, right? <laughs> yeah? And some of you say, no, not for you. <laughs> governor? What's a Governor? The Bible camp we served at, that was one of the things I taught some of the guys on the junior staff was how to remove the governor off of the golf carts. I should leave that alone because I'm on YouTube, but that ended up with some interesting scenarios in the hills of Tennessee. Golf carts going way faster than they should without a roll cage. Anyway, everybody survived. Neglect is not an option when it comes to the resources that God's given us. When he was talking to this rich man, he wasn't saying, neglect your resources and be apathetic about the future. He's saying, generosity is an expectation. Contentment is an expectation in the kingdom. That's what I want to finish with tonight. That's what I would like us to meditate on. Final passage tonight, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Please turn there with me as we close. You know, one thing I do on YouTube, sometimes I review the sermons and examine myself as a teacher to make sure I'm not doing anything that distracts and I'm doing well. And one of the things I do is whenever I say, and now in conclusion, I, I put a time marker on and I see how long it gets me to get to the conclusion. One of the best one was 11 and a half minutes. <laughs> Hopefully I'm improving on that. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 9. Remember this. The person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make every grace overflow to you, so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. As it is written, he scattered, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Tonight, church, I just want to remind us as we hear these commands of Christ, we're not to covet. We're not to be greedy. That's not an option. Matter of fact, when you look in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and you look at the uh, requirements for an elder and a deacon, one of those requirements is that they are not to be greedy. They're not to have this attitude of coveting what other people have. That is a requirement. Uh, we talk about the other requirements and we can get into all that, but you look for the requirements of leadership, and this is something that stays with the kingdom. There is an expectation of generosity. There's an expectation of this generous kind of love because he first generously loved us. Was Jesus Christ, did he cost us anything? No, what was he? He was a, he was a gift. He was a gift, and he is a gift still to this day. And that's the example we got to show to people by generosity. What kind of an opportunity is opened up when you give something to someone who is actually grateful and also realizes they don't deserve it? What kind of opportunity do you have to share the gospel at that point in time? A very practical one and a very powerful one. And whenever people observe your attitude of contentment, what kind of opportunity do we have to share the gospel whenever we can say, I know God's going to provide for my needs? We don't make a big show of it, but if somebody's like, hey, why aren't you getting this or that? And just say, you know, yeah, I would like it, but right now I just, uh, I just trust the Lord has given me what I need right now. And contentment's going to be at the root, and we'll talk about this another time. Contentment's at the root of a lot of other sins we find that we struggle with as Christians is when we get discontent, we start looking outside of God's design. That's another conversation for another time. It's enough to say, church, tonight, do not covet. Be generous. Be content with what the Lord's given.
Take his resources, the time and money he's given you, with an open hand. Let's do that tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the uh, wonderful gift you've given us through Jesus Christ, your Son. And we thank you and praise you for the time we have to gather here tonight and to hear your word, to sing your praises, to pray to you, to gather around and hear the, the uh, communion meditations around your table, Lord, just to stop and remember that sacrifice on the cross, that generosity. Heavenly Father, tonight, if there's any barriers in our hearts, if we've been givers and people have turned and slapped us in the face and we just don't want to give, prick our hearts to keep giving for your sake, not for other people's, not for the response, but for your reward. Lord, if we are not good at giving, period, I pray you prick our hearts to start being an example. And by being an example of generosity, we can create and generate opportunities with your spirit to share your gospel we thank and praise you for the examples of generosity that already exist in this family. And I pray they continue to step up as mentors teaching and leading others how to give and how to be content. Because with contentment, with godly contentment is great gain. Thank you for what you've given us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.